LC. How are we doing this morning? Are we ready to worship our Lord and Savior? Please rise and sing a hallelujah.
forget the wonders of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. And you found me, and you freed me, and you held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. By day, it's a sign that you are with me. The fire by night, the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, you held back the waters of my release. Oh, Yahweh.
just listen to the words of these songs. It's just totally amazing. Okay, Gino. <laughs> Savior, 
God, that we pause and we hear your voice as you speak to us, God. It's in your presence, Lord, um, that you go before us, as, as Moses said, Lord, go before me. May your presence go before me, and if it doesn't, I don't want to go, because it's your presence. It's your presence in our life that lets people know who we are. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who wants to be present with us. That has been the design since the creation of the world that you have always desired to be with your people. So much so that when Jesus had to leave and go to heaven, you didn't leave us as orphans. You left us the Holy Spirit to continue with the presence of God, the glory of God in our life, our bodies, the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit so we could continue to enjoy your leading. So, Father, we just praise you for that. We thank you, God, for this day. We give you honor and glory. And I pray, Lord, today that we will, throughout, because of, of this service today, God, I pray that when we walk out these doors, we will be different, we'll be changed, and we will be in your presence every step of the way. And we give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And welcome. Glad to have you here today. Good to see every one of you, and we just, this is an exciting time for our church. We just got a lot of things going on. Yep, a lot of whoop whoops there, <laughs> but a lot of things going on that we are really excited about, and let me jump into some of our news that we have uh, going on. Of course, we have our children's ministry. Uh, K-5 is probably uh, getting the, a, lot of, a lot of noise, a lot of excitement going on. Because we believe in resurrection here, so they are raising, their, the kids are going to go up to their own uh, ministry area beginning next Sunday. So you won't see little ones here, you'll see them up there, unless the parents want them down here, that's fine too. But we have, they have their own full 75 minute praise and worship, big space, room to just jump around, praise God, to get great instruction. And so that is happening uh, next week is their, the next two weeks are kind of like trial runs for us as we get ready for our big event, which is on September 11th. And so, um, and we're preparing that uh, place up there, and there's a little bit of work that needs to get done. And if you can help with that, today, uh, Justin and Ashley, who are leading our kids' ministry and our student ministries, they're going to be hanging around. And if you've got a couple extra hands and you've got some time and you can kind of help do a few things, I know that they would appreciate it. You might want to connect with Ashley and Justin. Justin's that wonderful guy there with the bright yellow shirt. So, and uh, so, yep. So, anyway, that's about kids' ministry going on. All right. Our growth track is a 90 minute class where we talk about our mission, our vision, and our values. And uh, really, it's all about people discovering God, you know, knowing God, finding freedom, discovering their purpose, and making a difference. That is our primary thing. And so uh, our next one is uh, the first it's on the first Sunday. We put it on Sunday nights. And the first Sunday of September, that's September 4th. I know it's Labor Day weekend, but it's that night. 
And if you are interested and you've not yet taken gone through that class, I really, really encourage you to get all your questions answered about our church, and it's an opportunity to plug in. we got small groups coming up. By the way, your worship guides are probably like a worship book this morning, filled with all sorts of things going on because our small group season is, is our fall semester will be starting in late September, so we're getting the pushing the information out to you now so you've got time to think about it, pray about it, figure out where you want to go. So, but there were... Uh, there's going to be two groups. I'll just mention them right now. There's two groups called uh, Battlefield of the Mind. It's a study by Joyce Meyer. Tremendous study. Talk about finding freedom and overcoming uh, things. That is a great study. One is going to be at my home. That my wife and I are hosting on Wednesday nights. The other one, Kay Wolf, is going to be hosting here on Thursday mornings in, in case nights don't work out for you and days are better at 11 o'clock in our fellowship hall. So on Thursdays. And so that's coming up. I'm also leading a reoccurring class. It's a class that I will teach probably once a year called um, The Blessed Life. And if you didn't get a chance to go through The Blessed Life this past spring, I'll be teaching that on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock in our fellowship hall. So those are some things that, that are coming up, and that's why you've got all those inserts and so on and so forth to kind of help you out. Um, this Saturday, big event, back-to-school event, where we're literally giving out hundreds of dollars worth of school supplies and uh, the team has done a great job, and I just want to give a shout out to Wilbur and Stephanie Gertner and Justin and Ashley Kopp and Amy Beisel. Would you give them a round of applause for the work that you're doing and have yet to do, which to still do. Um, but they have put that together. They have organized it so well. Uh, so, but there's always, you know, busy hands, or I'm sorry, many hands make life work. <laughs> and so uh, it doesn't take a spiritual gift to watch a table and hand out school supplies, okay? It just takes a, a willing heart to be able to do that. So there, if you have, if you would like to help out with that event, they have opportunities for you, and you can connect with any one of them, Wilbur, Stephanie, or Justin, or Ashley, or Amy, any one of those you can connect with, and I'm sure that they will be happy to help you. That's at 10 o'clock. The event is uh, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. That's the event time. They'll probably have uh, workers arrive a little earlier just to kind of get ready, okay? But that is really, really exciting. And so, uh, again, my thanks to our team uh, for doing that. That's really great. And, of course, we continue to serve the Lord and, and in an act of worship. We bring our tithes and offerings on Sunday morning. Of course, you can always do text to give and however that works for you. Uh, we're just always blessed. We, God really blesses us when we honor him with what belongs to him. And that's the first and the best of what he gives us. So just so you know about that. And that's about what we have for you today. Uh, probably a lot more that I could sh share, but not right now. We can always do that later. So right now, what I'd, like, what I'd like you to do is stand, turn, greet one another, and kids can go off to Better Life Kids.
Okay, come on in. This will be the last time I'll have to tell the uh, ushers to uh, close the uh, sliders in the back. You won't need to do that uh, anymore. Uh, I did forget to mention a couple things. Uh, the growth, our, I'm sorry, our connection cards. Make sure you fill out a connection card. It's the chief piece of communication around here. It lets us know what you need, how we can help, how we can serve. Uh, hey, Pete, make sure you get the end of it latched to the wall, too. Yeah, it's okay, over. very good. Awesome. Um, I'm just so excited about the, the kids' ministry area up there. If you haven't got a chance, uh, today you can go up and take a look. Um, you know, it's, it's just going to be a wonderful experience for the kids. If you haven't liked our, like, I know some, some we, we've had people come and not like our nursery area because it's really small. Guess what? They get 600 square feet of nursery now. <laughs> so huge nursery area, huge bit Better Life Kids area, and it's all going to uh, help us really grow. It's really going to uh, do a lot for you guys. Okay, so anyway, I'm excited, excited to share today, but first we've got a little message bumper here for you for Prayer of Jabez. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. I'm really excited about this time. Just one more time. We we have, in case you're wondering about, well, what does the pastor mean, big event on September 11th? We've got a mailer going out, inviting people to our church for, on September 11th. And, and it's going up to 5,000 homes. And it's uh, the series I'm doing is called, What on Earth Am I Here For? And it's all about purpose. And it's all about finding your purpose, all right? And so I am really excited about that. But i got to be honest, as excited I am, and that's going to be a great series, and I, I don't want to diss that series, but I got another amazing series that you're, you're going to really enjoy. I don't know if, based on your background and your church experience and all that, if you've ever been to, but I do a series in the fall called At the Movies. And, and literally, we, we watch movies, and we just don't watch movies, but I rework messages around movie themes, and we try to create a movie atmosphere. And I'm really, really excited for that. I've been looking ahead of that. I'm going, oh, these people are going to love this. You're going to love this. So we got some good stuff back to back. What on earth am I here for? That's going to go for five weeks in September into October. And then at the movies, you're going to really enjoy that. But today, Prayer of Jabez. Oh, by the way, if you've got your message notes, if you need a Bible or a pen to take notes, raise your hand, and we'll get a Bible or a pen in your hands. Um, and so, yes, we've been talking about... Uh, this uh, prayer of Jabez, let's uh, put it up on the screen here. I think it's the first thing that we put on the screen. So um, Jabez, it says, was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. And Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. And of course, if you're wondering, those are the shirts that we are wearing. Some of us have got the, our BIP shirts, Blessing, Influence, Presence, and Protection. And so if you never got a chance to order these, you should fill out one of the order forms, and maybe we can get another order going. Um, so anyway, that's what that's about. So week number one, we prayed about God blessing. <clears throat> Asking God, you know, people say, isn't that a little selfish to ask God to bless you? No, because you're asking God yes. that you want to do more for him, yes. more in the kingdom. So you're asking God to do more for him. Week number two, which was last week, we talked about influence. You know, our sphere of influence, the people around us. <clears throat> how we can, how we can uh, bless God with our influence, like with our assets, with what we have, with our time and our tithe and our talents. And then with, uh, with, our, with, our, with people around us, our family and then our community, <clears throat> we talked about influence. Today, as you heard us sing, we're talking about presence. And so um, how he touches our life with his presence. <clears throat> so today we're going to look at four people, four, biblical, four Bible characters, and how God touched them with his presence. <clears throat> the first one is Moses. And so for your message notes, Moses received God's touch to overcome excuses and inadequacies. Right? God had called Moses to this great work. 
And yet Moses had excuses. Let's look at the first one. God, God's call. I am sending you to Pharaoh. Moses' excuse. Uh, who am I that I should go? God's answer. I will be with you. Moses' excuse. What if they ask me your name? What name do I tell them? God's answer. I am. I wish you could do it like the Sissy <laughs> DeMille's, you know, Ten Commandments movie for those who remember that. Yeah. I am who I am. I'll send you. I don't have that deep voice. <laughs> Moses' excuse. What if they do not believe me or listen to me? God's answer. This, the miracle of the staff turning into a snake and so on, is so that they might believe. Moses' excuse. Well, I'm slow of speech and tongue. <laughs> God's answer, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Moses' excuse, please send someone else to do this. And God's answer is, take your brother Aaron to speak to him and your staff with the miracles. <clears throat> when we offer excuses or reasons to God of why we can't do something that he's called us and wants us to do in our life, we, we lose the blessing. We, we miss out. <clears throat> on what God really wants to do. See, he wants to touch our life to do significant and eternal work. So what might our excuses be? Kind of like um, Haggai. A few weeks ago, when we went to the Haggai, you know, they were waiting, kind of waiting to, until they got that round to it, you know. We'll build the temple when this is right. We'll do it when this is right. In other words, people will, will say, I will make spiritual progress in my life, but first I got to take care of my family, and first I got to take care of this, and first I got to take care of that, and you have a bunch of things that you th feel that you have to go on, and uh, those are excuses like Moses had offered, okay? And we might say, I'm not smart enough, tall enough, talented enough, good looking enough, don't have enough hair, whatever, okay? Even though I, when I referee basketball games, they always tell me to get the hair out of my eyes. So um, we need to see ourselves as God sees us. See, that's what Moses needed to do. That's what we need to do. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. In fact, I got a fun story here, a biblical story, another character, Gideon. This is, he's kind of partnered up with, with Moses as far as when it comes to excuses and God's call. Um, God called Gideon. Let's read here Judges chapter 6. Got a few screens of this. In Judges chapter 6, it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said... And I put it on, on my, in my notes, I have it underlined, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Hang on to that thought, okay? The Lord is with you. Verse 13, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, now where does the if comes from? I know. It just said the Lord is with you. <laughs> so Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, then why has this ha all this happened to us? Uh, where are all these wonders that our ancestors told us about, they said? Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us in the hand of Midian. So Israel, this is the period of Judges. It's a dark period in Israel's history. And they're being oppressed at this phase by the Midianites, a group of uh, people that were um, uh, idolaters. So the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? The cl my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. See, that's Gideon's outlook on himself. My clan is the, the weakest, and I'm the weakest. I can't do that. God said, mighty warrior. <laughs> that's who God saw, okay? Um, God told Gideon that he would have victory. In fact, if you were to read that passage, it, it's just comical to me because God had told Gideon, you're going to have victory. You're going to have victory. And four times in Judges 6, God tells Gideon he's going to have victory. Yet Gideon repeatedly, first he said, okay, Lord, if you really are going to do this, he puts the sacrifice out and wants God to burn up the sacrifice, all right? So, so that's what he wants to have happen. So even though God told him he's going to have a victory, then he does the famous fleece thing. Now, if you grew up in the church, you might have heard the story how Gideon takes a dry fleece and puts it on, on the ground, and he wants the ground to be wet but the fleece to be dry, to stay dry. And God does it, all right? And then he does the opposite. He wants the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. And God does it. He's doing this to, to see if God, but, but God had already told him four times he's going to have victory. Now, I am not anti-fleece. When I say that, I mean some people put a fleece of the, will say, God, if you're calling me to do this, will you do this in my life? Okay, I'm, I'm sure we've all done that, you know. Um, you know, uh, God, if you're calling me, 
to uh, serve you at back to school event, then when I drive past this building, let this person walk out of the building, okay? And, and the person walks out. So after four times, nobody's walking. So we do the fleece thing with God. I'm not going to beat you up on that. And, but what I'm saying is that that is not really, um, in this passage, the way to determine God's will when particularly he says you're going to win. You're going to have the victory. Gideon didn't have to do that. If anything, that passage teaches us God's graciousness. How he graced Gideon, you know. Gideon repeatedly asked him for a sign, even though God repeatedly said he was going to have the victory. <clears throat> we need to see ourselves as God sees us. Yes. Mighty warrior. Yes. A couple weeks ago, I shared a uh, similar concept with our dream team. <clears throat> Jeremiah was called to tell Israel, the people of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, to tell them that you need to get your life in order because God is bringing judgment. He's going to put us in captivity unless we turn our lives around. Jeremiah did not want to preach that. That's not a popular thing. All right? And so Jeremiah is kind of resisting this, but God has a significant work for Jeremiah to do. So then God gives Jeremiah some encouragement. And he says, you are a fortified city. You're an iron pillar. You're a bronze wall. Nobody will be able to stand up to your words, Jeremiah. Amen. See, that's how God saw Jeremiah. Yes. That's how God saw Gideon. Jabez's name means pain. But no matter how people might label us, we are special to God. Yes. And we need to see ourselves as God has created us. We are significant to God, like Jabez. We need to turn our desire into a request, and God will answer. So God is touching us with his presence to do his significant and eternal work, and he does it really well when we acknowledge of who we are in his eyes. That's the first point. The second person that I see here is King David. David receives God's touch to overcome a giant in his life. <clears throat> Let's look at the passage. You're probably well familiar with this. 1 Samuel 17. David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of, his, of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Mountaintop experiences. <clears throat> Mountaintop experiences are to help us get through tough times. Mountaintop experiences are to help us get through tough times times. What might be some mountaintop experiences? Well, graduation from high school, you know, graduation from college, uh, first career job, marriage, savior. I, I asked Christ to be my savior. Amen. First child, uh, going to a particular conference, a church service. It's that aha moment when you feel like you're on the mountaintop and all is well. All is well. This is grand. This is glorious. It can't get any better than this. Amen. All right? That's a mountaintop experience. But mountaintop experiences are great for the moments, but they have not only, can follow me on this, they not only have a in-the-moment value, but largely they also have a longer-term value in the future. Like a wedding can be a mountaintop experience. I performed dozens and dozens and dozens of weddings. And I remember one year, it was on a Saturday, I was uh, overseeing referees, go figure, at a, at a Gus Macker tournament in Greenville. I had to leave early on Saturday afternoon because I had to go from Greenville to the Hardy Dam area where I had to perform at 3 o'clock, a backyard wedding ceremony. So I do the wedding. Backyard, small, goes along. I mean, if, 
They just wanted the vows. They didn't want the, no music, no special thing, you know, type of thing. So that went pretty quick. And I'm watching this couple say their vows. <clears throat> this mountaintop experience for them. But then I got to get in my car. Because I got to drive down to St. Mary's Hospital. Because one of the lady in my congregation was on death doors. Her husband, Bill, was there when I walked in. I walked in, and this couple had been married probably 50 years. And she's feverish, and she's laying in the hospital bed. This has captured my attention, and that's why I'm even sharing it with you right now. <clears throat> and he's taking the cloth and wetting it and putting it on her forehead giving her the ice chips, you know, on the raw lips. And I thought, that young couple I just saw an hour and a half ago exchanging vows on the mountaintop, Bill is living these vows out now with his wife. Yeah. He's taking the mountaintop experience and he's bringing it down into this very deep valley that they were going through. That's what mountaintop experiences are for. They have an in the moment value. Aha! Awesome! Great! Can't get any better! To bring us into those, to remember during those difficult times. Yes. My goodness, read the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. It's amazing. Moses is off the scene, and God is telling Joshua, You're the new leader, and let me tell you. And, you know, following Moses is kind of a tough act, you know. So he's telling Joshua, Wherever your footsteps, wherever you go, I'm going to give you victory. And you read Joshua chapter 1, and it's like it's a done deal. But that was just a good chapter. By the time you get to chapter 13, you find there's a list of 31 kings. That Joshua and Israel had to overcome. <laughs> All right? Yes, God's going to bless them, but it isn't going to be easy. He's going to take that mountaintop experience and he's going to have to have it in the valley to overcome these kings. I could do a sports illustration for you guys that still want me to be consistent with my sports and say, like in Rocky 3, you know, Rocky yeah. had been on the top of you guys. Yeah, yeah, I, know that. I don't have a clip for you, by the way. But, um,. <laughs> But you're going, yeah, Rocky III, I remember that Rocky. He's the champion. He finally beats Apollo Creed, and now he's on the top of the world. But then this guy, Clubber Lang, takes him out in this first fight. And, uh, and Rocky doesn't know what happened, and he's being told by his trainer, you've lost your edge. You've got to get back. You've got to get back. You've got to remember what it took when you were on the mountain, what it took to get there, you see. Uh, you know, I remember when I was doing youth ministry. Uh, the church I was attending doing youth ministry, we had a special great week. It was 1982. 1982 is like a big year in this person's life, in my life. Okay, it was 40 years ago. 1982, 40 years ago, I graduated from Ferris State College with my degree in education. Um, 40 years ago, my, my uh, hero, music hero, Keith Green, went to heaven in an airplane crash. 40 years ago, just a few days ago, August 16th, my dad went to heaven. And then 30 days later, I'm in this uh, great service. The church is growing. I'm doing youth ministry. I mean, we uh, Friday night, we had this great thing. We were told we had an evangelistic service. We had an evangelist come in for the weekend. And on Friday night, he preached a message called, Is There Really a Hell? And we were told by some of the naysayers in the church, and there are sometimes naysayers, people who lack faith, and they just have, they let doubt creep in. You know, small town like New York, you're not going to get people out for a Friday night service. Don't you know it's football? It's a home football game. And 135 people out that night, and five men came to know Christ. The next Saturday, I'm doing the next morning on Saturday, I'm doing youth ministry, and we're doing capture the flag with the kids and acting crazy and having all sorts of fun. And then Sunday morning, the evangelist is preaching again, and he preaches this message called "The Spoils of War" from First Samuel chapter 30. I remember it was like yesterday because that's the service I shared with you before that I sat in, and he said. God has not called us to the recreation room. God has called us to the battlefield. And I'm sitting, I'm doing youth ministry and teaching. And I'm, but, I, but the thought went through my mind is, Lord, I just want to do something significant for you. And I'm not saying those are insignificant, but for me at that moment in my calling, I just, there, was, there was just something that resonated with me in that message, and I wanted to do more. And it was on that very, very same week, and I heard for the very first time, have you ever considered the pastorate? No. So that's when I started praying. 
That weekend was phenomenal. Mountaintop experience. And the fact that I'm sharing with you, not that I consider right now a valley, but I shared, I think of those things. What it taught me was Monday morning came. What that weekend taught me was exactly about mountaintop experiences. We had all these great experiences. We didn't want the weekend to end. Have you ever had that? You've been at a conference. You've been at an event. You don't want it to end because Monday's coming. But Monday comes. But you just bring that experience into that with you. I planted churches. I, plant, I pastored five churches. Three I've planted. This is the third. I've done this before. So I have, I have, I've had the mountaintop experience. So I know when we go through a valley, I can help. I can help some of you stabilize and understand this is what you can expect. This is what, you know, that kind of thing. In fact, I was told many years ago to keep an encouragement file. And that is because if you're in ministry, and this, I don't think it's just unique to ministry, but it is true about ministry, is you want to file. Anytime somebody gives you a word of encouragement, you want to file that because you're going to have valleys we're going to walk through oh, and you need to go back because then the enemy will use the valley to get you confused and thinking negative thoughts you need to go back to that encouragement file and pull those out and remember you know it's back to that what how, how does god see you and how has god used you i took that encouragement it was a file full now it's a now it's a three ring binder that i have on my shelf and i've kind of organized it and i go back and i look at some of the notes that people have written me 30 years ago up to current all right mountaintop experiences they have that value at the moment, but they have future value as well. You see, and how does this apply with David? Well, as he faced the giant, David had previous experiences. All right? He, beat, he defeated a lion and a bear. Here's a thought. Before the giant would fall, there must be a lion and a bear. David, David didn't go in there with Goliath with no experience. He'd, defeated a, he'd taken out a bear. He'd taken out a lion. And, and, and for David... God was a living reality in David's life. Not a dead or distant God, but a living reality. And God's presence in your life will help you identify the mountaintop experiences so you can face the valleys when they come your way. If you'd like to hear more on this, come back. Just keep coming every Sunday. And in November, when I follow my, when I finish my At the Movie series, I'm going to preach on how to overcome giants that defy you. That's coming. That's coming your way. All right, number three. The third person is Isaiah. Isaiah receives God's touch of clean, cleanliness and proclaims God's word. Let's look at Isaiah 6. It's uh, eight verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him, you understand the train of his robe, it's the robe, it's going out, it's not like a choo-choo, choo-choo, no, it's not, not that. Okay. Okay. And above him were seraphim, angelic creatures, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two things they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's not what that means. Holy, 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 it's a Hebrew euphemism which, means, which is showing... The degree of his holiness, how holy he really is. is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man, a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom, will I, whom shall I send and who will go for us? There's your trinity. And he said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah's problem. He said, Woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Uh, many believe, many theologians believe that Isaiah had a problem with profanity, that that may have been his problem. Now, I'm not talking about those rare and random events when you hit yourself with a hammer and you go, <coughs> or when you stop suddenly and you look in your mirror and someone's not stopping, they're coming, and you go, oh, and then you do it. I'm not talking about that at all. <laughs> not talking about that at all. 
Okay, talking about someone who has a lifetime of an issue there, and, and so that may have been Isaiah's issue there. But he sees himself compared to God's revealed in his absolute glory. And a thought here is unclean lips are a product of an unclean heart. God touches Isaiah's mouth and sends him to proclaim his word. See, that's what God's presence can do. He can take that unclean part in your life. For Isaiah, it was his lips. Maybe for you and me, it's something else, okay? And if you like God, he will use you. He'll redeem that area that maybe you struggle with. He can redeem that and use that for his honor and for his glory. <clears throat> See, the enemy will remind you <clears throat> about your past failures. Perhaps he reminded Isaiah of the use of profanity <clears throat> and that God could never use him to say a prophetic word. But our God is about being the voice of more in our life. Our God is the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, the fifth chance. All right? <clears throat> our God is merciful, and he's the God who will, <clears throat> who will let you have a do-over in life. See, sin <clears throat> is against God. And the results of sin are felt by people. But God is willing to give us a do-over. John writes in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sin, <clears throat> he is faithful and just to, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's writing to believers. 1 John is written to believers. In fact, in chapter 2 he says, <clears throat> you know, if you sin, there's none that do not sin. If you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, right? But the idea is that if we confess, God is willing and faithful and just because of the work of Jesus. David prayed for a pure, clean heart on the heels of his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. In Psalm 51, David writes this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God is willing and desires his presence in your life to touch you in maybe that area of uncleanness so that you can be used by him. So a thought is, what area in your life, my life, what area might we have that might be unclean, that we struggle with, that we can give to God? that we can give to God and ask him to touch and to purify us so that we can be used by him. All right, the fourth group of people is disciples of Jesus uh, were touched by God's presence to turn the world upside down. In Acts 17, it says, And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And people saw them, the other passage is in Acts 4, when people saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. As, as I prayed earlier today in the Old Testament, you know, it was Moses who said, God, if, if your presence isn't going to go before us, we don't want to go. Sure. Because it's your presence in our life that defines who we are as believers. Jesus is in the life-changing business. He desires us to live a blessed and abundant or a better life. And Jesus said that when he departs, he's not going to leave us as orphans, but he would send us the Holy Spirit and that we would do greater things. And right here in John 14, he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will even do greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Peter, who denied the Lord three times, was touched and turned around and allowed to preach the opening day message at Pentecost. Paul, Saul, who persecuted believers, became perhaps the greatest missionary, perhaps the greatest apostle. He wrote half of the New Testament, almost half, because of God's touch. But you know, as I think of contemporary people, a couple of people come to mind, a lot of people come to my mind, but maybe one or two that I can share is Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was a, uh, an atheist, 
and he wrote for the Chicago Tribune in their legal section. And his wife became a believer. And she started going to church and it created havoc in her marriage. And, and he didn't want her to do this, but she did. And so to kind of show her and prove her wrong, he sets out to disprove Christianity. And being a person who wrote for the Tribune in the legal section, he's all about facts. Getting the facts, getting it right. And he does a search. And, and, he's, and his search concludes that everything that was written in the Bible was accurate. In fact, you could take it in a court of law and win cases. And Lee's trouble because of that, because God had touched him, became a believer. And today, I think he even pastors a church down in Texas. Another man that I'm just fascinated with, his name is Bill Wilson. His mother left him at age 12 in the streets of New York City. Right? Bill Wilson was adopted by some a Christian family, went to a Christian camp, accepted Christ, and had his life turned around, and today reaches thousands of children through Sunday school ministry in the urban area in New York City. And he has been attacked many times, and yet he continues because of God's touch. I want you to see this video clip about Bill Wilson. In a very strange twist of irony, this is not the first time Reverend Bill Wilson has survived a close brush with death. It is an astonishing story that happens right here on this spot on Wednesday. The minister, Bill Wilson, was standing here, turned around, taking pictures of the beautiful Manhattan skyline. It was for his church newsletter. Pastor Bill Wilson was here on 10th Avenue and North 9th Street around 10 o'clock Wednesday evening. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, two men walked off and tried to rob him. One got the pastor into a chokehold from behind, shoved his gun into the pastor's mouth and pulled the trigger twice. The minister thought, this is it, my life is over. A gun down his throat and the mother pulled the trigger. I heard a click. And I knew then that it was pretty serious then. So I thought, well, I better do something. I knew that this, they were playing them. I, I knew that if I could stay there and take another one more, I was going to have to do something. And I just said, Jesus, help me. And I turned, and the gun went off, and it just felt like my whole head exploded. I was a little disoriented, obviously. So I just got back to my truck and called 911 and then drove myself to the hospital. I know that could have been the end very easily. But it wasn't. That's what real faith is, is when you know something and you believe it, and then it's put into action. The minister is meeting today with police. There are no suspects in the case. But Bill Wilson won't sit around and wait. He'll be out preaching again tomorrow. Whether people choose to believe in miracles or not, this was a miracle. And I'm sitting here today because it is a miracle. You know, my time is not ready yet. My job's not done yet. <laughs> Wilson founded his Bushwick-based Metro Ministry Sunday School 22 years ago. He offers Christian teaching, anti-drug and anti-crime programs to 20,000 children each week in several Metro Ministries around the city. Reverend Wilson has been preaching against violence, against drugs for 35 years. He works closely with children in this passion. Members of Reverend Wilson's church met him at the hospital. My little boy was like destroyed. He was, he was crying. He was feeling bad about it. I mean, I tried to come here and keep him strong, just like Pastor Bill wanted. All New Yorkers can celebrate Reverend Wilson's survival. You know, when my mother left me on the street corner when I was a little kid, that was a defining moment for me. When I got hit with a brick several years ago, it was a robbery. Same deal. That was another defining moment. And I think now this is another one. Up on the hospital, but you see, you know, faith tested was the video clip it said. But there again, talking about God's touch and His presence in our life, where we literally people can turn the world upside down. And surely Bill Wilson is doing that there. If the worship team wants to come up as we get close here. And so, how has God touched you? How have you experienced God's presence in your life? Do you do you see yourself as, as maybe your flesh sees you, or do you see yourself as God sees you? You know, like a Gideon, you know, mighty warrior, okay? Has um, God called you? Do you make excuses like Moses, or do you just, you know, follow through and be that person that God has called you to be? 
Perhaps like Isaiah the prophet, maybe there's an unclean area that we just need God's presence and touch in our life. And we need him to touch that area in our life. Or perhaps like the disciples, like Lee Strobel, like Bill Wilson, touched by the presence of the Lord to truly turn the world upside down. That's why when we pray the prayer of Jabez, it's not a selfish prayer at all. We're praying for blessing. We pray for influence. And you've seen firsthand what praying for the presence and the touch of God can do in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time this morning that we've had. We thank you, God, for these examples in the scripture of people who were touched by your presence, God. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us see ourselves as you see us and not letting other people define us. Lord, that we would take those areas in our life that are unclean and allow you to touch them and use them to glorify yourself. You can redeem those areas for your honor and glory. And Lord, help us then to be like the disciples, to be like Lee Sproul, to be like Bill Wilson, to be so touched by your Holy Spirit, by your presence, that we literally turn the world upside down. Even when a gun is placed in our mouth, we stay out. We, we stay faithful because of your touch and your presence in our life, Father. Father, we just thank you, Lord, so much for this word that you've given us today. This word to encourage us, God, in this prayer chain of us. We pray for blessing influence in God your presence. And it's not a selfish prayer, but it's a prayer of your presence of what you can do in our life. Father, we are open to you. We love you. We praise you. We want to glorify you. And we are ready now, Father, for your presence in our life to use us for all of your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a couple things uh, as we transition. Just run I want to remind you to fill out your connection cards this morning and drop those if the ushers want to get ready. Uh, to drop those in the offering buckets. Again, you, you get the hassle-free guarantee. No one's going to show up at your door. I just want to send you a letter and say, hey, thank you for coming. Here are some next steps. Um, <clears throat> there's also a prayer card on the bottom of the connection card. And uh, we like to pray, pray with people and for people. And so we're happy to pray for you. Uh, remember, we have a Saturday prayer. Saturday's here at 9 o'clock. And... Uh, those prayer cards, we, we literally, we put them up here and we come and we pray over all those prayer cards. So fill that out. Everybody has needs and everybody has need for prayer. We're happy to do that. So uh, um, that's just one more thing. Um, and of course, as we get ready to uh, just remember, we receive our, when we bring our tithes and offerings, if you're new here, you don't feel obligated to give. But you know, we just love to serve God and bring him our first and our best. And so that's what we do this morning. That's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to pray. But by the way, if you need prayer, and you want someone to pray with you this morning, you don't want to wait to do the prayer card, you want someone to pray with you or for you, our prayer team will be up here. So as, as the team is playing the last song, as we're receiving the offering, you can come up and receive prayer during that. We have to pray for you, all right? So let's just pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for these examples that you've shown us in your word about people who were touched by your presence. I pray, God, you'll do that with us as well, Lord, that we will be open and ready and willing for what you want to do in our life. And, Lord, this morning, we worship you. We bring our tithes and offerings as an act of worship. It's not, a, it's not by obligation. It's not by demand. It's just because we love you and we praise you for what you've done. And we ask that you bless this offering to your honor and glory. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand to your feet as the offering is coming, and we're going to uh, have this last song, I Saw the Light. Let's sing it together. If you need prayer, come on up right now. I saw the light. I saw the light.
I saw the light. 